Hello everyone, I'm Miss Scarf, one of the English teachers and the Literacy Coordinator at Halewood Academy. I'm just going to do a short session with you today about how we can use vital literacy skills in everyday life, particularly writing skills in this session. So we're going to focus in particular upon how to construct a formal letter using appropriate vocabulary and showing awareness of purpose and audience. These skills should help you not only in your own day to day life to recap some of the key elements of writing skills that you need to use, but also should help you to fully support your child in their studies from home. So we're just going to think about comedian Rod Gilbert for the purpose of this task. Rod Gilbert bases a lot of his stand up comedy routines um, upon complaints he has about everyday situations. So he comes up with an array of minor daily inconveniences and annoyances that he experiences and then he exaggerates them and blows them massively out of proportion in the name of humour. On one such occasion he tells the audience about his experience on the quiet carriage in a train which turned out to be quite the opposite. He lists numerous issues such as the repeated tannoy announcements, the behaviour of noisy passengers and the relentless stewards interrupting him to offer snacks and check tickets as reasons for his journey being unacceptable. We are going to imagine we are Mr Gilbert in this situation and we are going to write a formal letter to National Rail complaining about our experience. So the first things to consider before we start to write a letter are these four things. So purpose, audience, language and layout. So in other words, for purpose, what are we writing the letter about or what are we intending to achieve from it? Who is our audience? Who is going to be the recipient of the letter? What relationship does this person have to us? Do we know them? Are they an employer? Are they a friend? What sort of language are we going to use? Is it going to be formal or informal? Do we need to keep our language simple or not? Does it need to be clear? Do we need to include facts and figures? How can we vary our language to hold the reader's interest? And finally, layout. Is there a particular format to use when structuring a letter? What should it look like on the page? So for this task that we are going to complete, involving the complaint letter from Mr Gilbert to National Rail, we are writing a formal letter of complaint, so that is our purpose. We're seeking to express our frustration and possibly seeking some form of recompense or compensation or at least an apology from the company. Our audience is a manager or supervisor in the company. We don't know this person, they're a stranger. In terms of language, we need to use formal language, we need to use standard English, and we need to be persuasive and possibly use emotive language to make our argument engaging and convincing. In terms of the layout, there is a typical structure of a formal letter that we're going to re recap in a moment that we need to be using to write this letter. So generally speaking, to begin a formal letter, we need to remember a few key details. The first being that our address should be on the top right hand side of the letter as you can see in this example. Underneath that we should have the date that we are writing the letter. On the left hand side however it should be the address of the person you are writing to as you can see in the example here and then if you are writing a formal letter to an unknown recipient so in other words to someone whose name you aren't sure of um, we need to begin our letter with either to whom it may concern or dear sir or madam because we're not sure whether it's going to be a male or a female reading it and we don't know their name. Since it is a formal letter and we want our argument to be as clear, coherent and convincing as possible, we need to carefully consider our vocabulary choices. We need to make sure we're using standard English and at all times avoiding slang or common grammar mistakes. So if you write down then as many examples as you can now to describe your feelings about the service you may have received in this situation, use your imagination a little bit. You're particularly annoyed about this experience you've had on the quiet carriage. What adjectives could you use to describe your feelings? The first things that come into your mind might be things such as this. You might have thought of angry, annoyed, possibly raging, possibly fuming, wound up, rubbish or lousy. However, some of these first words we've thought of are informal or slang expressions and we need to make sure for the purpose of this that we're using just formal language. 
This is for clarity more than anything else. Sometimes if the person that we're writing to isn't from the same area as us, they aren't going to necessarily understand colloquial expressions such as fuming or boss. It, this might mean something different where they're from. So it could lead to misinterpretation of what you're trying to say. And as such, it would weaken your argument. Let's think of some more precise alternatives that we could use meaning the same thing. So instead of angry, raging or fuming, we could say furious, irritated, antagonized. Instead of annoyed, we could say irritated, dissatisfied, disappointed. Instead of rubbish, we're trying to think what we mean by that. So if we're being more specific, in what way has it been rubbish? What, what is it that annoyed us particularly about the surface? What was unsatisfactory that we're talking about? Then we can think of words such as unacceptable, neglectful, inconvenient, unreliable and inconsistent. Use a thesaurus or an online dictionary if you're not sure of ideas off the top of your head. So gathering some ideas now to help us sustain clarity and to organise a structure for our argument. So what might have happened to cause irritation on the chain, train journey? These are just some possibilities you could use. So you could talk about loud, disruptive fellow passengers. They could be talking really loudly. They could be playing their music really loudly. Constant tannoy announcements is one of the things Mr. Gilbert talked about in his comedy show. So these could be crackling and involving interference so that you can't listen to your music clearly or you can't watch something clearly or talk to the people around you. There could be regular interruptions from people working on the train. They could seem disorganised. They could maybe spill some coffee on you. There could be litter in the carriage. There could be interference on the loudspeakers. There could be a train delay, either the arrival of the train to the platform or to the destination. And there could be a lack of availability of facilities on board. So in the bold writing, I've given you some suggestions of higher level vocabulary, particularly adjectives you could use to exaggerate your points and to describe the effect that these scenarios have had on you. So instead of just saying the tannoy announcements were happening all the time, you could use words such as unrelenting, persistent, relentless, as though you were, you know, being driven to the edge by it. Instead of loud passengers annoying you, you could use words such as inconsiderate, disruptive to describe them. If you're talking about the train being late, you could talk about it being a disorganised, chaotic and unreliable service. So if we're planning our structure then of how we're going to order our arguments, since we've got quite a lot of points here to cover, we want to think about ranking our points from the most important or the strongest argument to the least important. Here I've ordered our points we've just discussed from one being the strongest and most relevant to what we're talking about to the least relevant or the weakest point. So I've started saying the most important point we're going to make is about maybe the loud disruptive fellow passengers followed by the tannoy announcements then followed by less relevant points, maybe like the steward interrupting you, interference on the loudspeakers, lack of availability of facilities, litter in the carriage and toilets out of order. The last three aren't directly about there being a problem with the quiet carriage. These are just additional problems that we could bring up to show how annoyed we are with the service we experienced. We need to be careful not to use all of your strongest points too early in the letter, otherwise the reader will lose interest and the latter part of the letter will seem less relevant. So we're going to save our best point until a little bit further down. So just an example opening to this letter, we've used that layout that we talked about with your address being on the top right, followed by the date and the address of the person you're writing to, in the case of this being National Rail Inquiries on the left hand side. The address doesn't have to be entirely accurate, it's just to give you an idea how to structure the layout. And we're beginning our letter, as we said earlier, because we don't know the intended recipient with the phrase to whom it may concern. So highlighted in blue, purple and red, you have different sections of this opening to show you. The blue bit is a brief introduction, telling the person reading the letter why we are writing, setting the scene a little bit for our situation. The purple part is where we're going to get the reader on side, show a bit of respect, possibly flatter them slightly to make them value what you say and to get on board with your argument. For the red part, we're making our purpose and our tone clear and assertive without being rude. We don't want to antagonise the person reading it because they're not going to bother with the rest of our argument if we offend them early on. 
Next, we'll focus on a point pair paragraph after this. So let's read this opening example so you can see what you're aiming for. To whom it may concern, I am writing to you to express my deepest dissatisfaction with the service I experienced on a recent train service using your company. My husband had booked us tickets as an anniversary present and we were traveling to visit friends in Glasgow. So I've set the scene here. I've described how I'm feeling about what's happened and why I'm writing to them. As regular National Rail customers, we are used to receiving high quality service with minimum disruption. Due to this, we were not dissuaded by the recent escalation in prices and decided to remain loyal to your company. So we've tried to convince the reader here that we're valued customers and we regularly use their service. We don't want them to think that we never use it and this is a one off. We want them to try to keep us as valued customers and, and in other words, try to appease us in their response to this letter. So then we carry on. However, on reflection, it is possible that we have made an error in judgment. Unfortunately, we are extremely disappointed with the service we received during our journey last month. So we've started that last sentence there with an adverb, unfortunately, to express our feelings and our tone and to suggest that we are disappointed with our experience. Thinking about the next part of our letter, we need to consider some possible devices we could utilise in order to make our argument as powerful and convincing as possible. So I've suggested some examples on this slide here, which you can refer to when you're having a go at your own letter. On the top, and these are techniques we advise students to use as well when they're creating their own formal letter, you've got some suggested persuasive devices you could implement. So the first one being direct address, saying you or we or are, to engage and involve the reader in what you're saying, to feel as though you're talking to them as well. Then you've got alliteration where you start two words with the same letter. I used two of those in the previous example I've just shown you, disappointed and dissatisfied. This makes what you're saying memorable and it emphasizes your point as well. You could use a fact. The amount of passengers on the service has increased by three times. You need to sound like you've researched the matter and you know what you're talking about, in other words. An opinion. In my opinion, this is dreadful and inexcusable. You could also use phrases such as from my perspective or if you ask me. A rhetorical question is a great way to get the reader question their opinions on the matter and to, again, ask them to become involved in what you're saying. How would you like to pay a considerable price for nothing but disruption? Emotive language or exaggeration is really important. If you think about Rod Gilbert using exaggeration for the purpose of humour, here we're not trying to create humour, we're trying to make a strong point to the reader so that they get on board and they want to help us out, in other words. A statistic, again, similar to a fact, is a great way of backing up your argument and showing you've done your research. So I've used an example there. 75% of national rail journeys involve a delay of more than 10 minutes. And finally, triplets, or in other words, using three words in a row for emphasis and to reinforce your point. I've given you an example there. The other thing we need to try and use, since it's going to be quite a long, detailed letter, is some connectives. These help us to start our paragraphs in a varied way, to structure our argument and to avoid repetition, in other words. So you've got some examples there you can refer to instead of just using familiar words such as also or firstly, secondly, thirdly. So here's an example first paragraph using persuasive devices that we've just discussed and using some of those connectives. I've highlighted them in different colours so that you can see whereabouts they are. So it says, firstly, we had paid a premium at the time we booked our tickets so that we could be seated in the part of the train designated as the quiet carriage. However, to our annoyance and disappointment, this title was misleading and inaccurate. In reality, what we experienced was unrelenting tannoy announcements every five minutes. What made this worse was that we could barely decipher the message due to the poor quality of the speakers. It was disturbance for the sake of mere disturbance. How are you supposed to relax or get any work done when you are being constantly interrupted by a loud crackling voiceover? This was inconsiderate, extremely irritating and unnecessary. So here we've got some connectives in purple. As you can see, we've got an example of exaggeration and emotive language. We've got our main argument in the maroon colour about the tannoy announcement interrupting us. We've used some more emotive language further down there in red. 
In the orange, we have a rhetorical question, and in the blue, we have a triplet, all of which help to make our first paragraph a really precise, decisive, and coherent argument, which we can carry on with for the next part of the letter. At the end of your letter, once you've made all of your main points, it's really important to include a brief conclusion, summarising or giving an overview of your main argument and suggesting a proposed outcome to which the reader can respond. So this might be that you intend them to write back to you, it might be that you intend to receive a refund or an apology or something along those lines. For a formal letter, you need to end it with either yours faithfully or yours sincerely. If you have a specific person to send your letter to, for example, Mr Smith, then you use yours sincerely because you have a named recipient. However, if you do not know a specific person to whom the letter is addressed and you are beginning with dear sir or madam or to whom we may concern, you need to use yours faithfully. So we are taking the blue example there. We are using yours faithfully. So here's an example of how we could conclude. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Yours faithfully, Miss S. Scarf. Now is your chance to apply this knowledge we've talked about. So your task is to write a formal letter to National Rail complaining about a recent negative experience you had of a journey in one of their quiet carriages. You should try to include the following things. Make sure you follow the guidance we discussed about how to structure it and about avoiding using slang. And please remember and tell your children as well when they are doing a long piece of writing to proofread your work when you're finished to avoid making any careless mistakes. We really hope that this session has been useful and that it has provided you with some practical advice you can use in your own everyday life and that you can use when supporting your child in writing formally from home. Thank you for listening. Any queries, please don't hesitate to contact one of the English teachers.